So welcome to the show, JJ. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, Emily, I know this is serendipitous, right? Very spiritually aligned. So I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, it really is. And I'm so excited to talk with you about your book, Seeking. I loved it and it was very intuitively led for me. So I I would really sit with it and just like open to a random page and it would be exactly what I needed to read in that moment. And I'm not sure if you designed it that way or not, but I wanted to share that and just kind of, yeah, hear your process. Like what led you to write this book? And I know you have many other books too, but this one specifically. Oh my gosh. Seeking for me is really such a spiritual journey. And I have heard that multiple times now where people use it like the Oracle, they just open up a page and start reading and how poignant the message is, whether it's a key finding or a chapter title. But I, you know, I was turned down six times for this book. And I think that's important for a lot of people because sometimes you have something on your heart that is ahead of where the marketplace is, or is ahead of where society might be. And this book for me, I really see as a bridge book for a lot of people that know there's something more they should be doing, but they don't know how to like crack it open. And when I initially pitched it to publishers, they were like, well, it's not completely spiritual. It's not completely self-help. It's really not a business book. Like we don't know where to put it. And I would say, this is a bridge book. This is to get people over from where they are to where they're going. But you know, a lot of things in society are very masculine energy that are very container based, like it has to fit in a container. And so many of us know from like spirituality and managing our own feminine and masculine energy that sometimes there isn't a container yet for the work that you're doing. And seeking is one of those creations that is really here to foster us to the next lesson, the next level of wisdom, the next level of work. And so even though I got six no's, I was guided by the universe to write it. And now I know why I got so many no's because I wouldn't be able to write it the way it's written with short chapters, the questions in the book, the key findings and the cover. They would have never let me do that cover. And the cover really showcases what you're doing off the side of your desk. So a lot of us are so busy doing our main work, but off the side of our desk, we might be going to that class or reading that book or working on something that we haven't told anybody about. And that really was important to me to showcase that, that it, you know, it's not always your main thing. Oh, so much goodness there. I love hearing that too. I think it's really helpful for my listeners to hear as well, it's like it took six no's and you knew that that didn't mean no. It just meant like refining your message and sharing it and continuing it and just knowing this is what wants to come through. And it's really helpful to hear too, like the context of, yeah, like maybe our society isn't ready to hear it in a certain way or like the timing wasn't the exact um, right time yet, but I'm glad that you persisted <laughs> and went through with it because it is really helpful to hear your experience throughout and then have the questions like really help um like me I'll just say like reflect on how um I can show up differently what's in the way and yeah and I love the point that you talk about in the book too of like you had this uh sense that when you were sharing about your message of seeking that people like you didn't feel as accepted about sharing about energy and feminine and things like that. How did you overcome just those feelings of like sharing that message in relation to work? Well, I have to say, I really started on this journey in 2016 and I just rounded the corner of the last 18 months. I would say it took a long time to really have confidence in what I was doing because I ended up kind of seeking at a new level when things around me started falling apart, my work, my job, my husband, my kids, like just things just weren't hitting on the cylinders that I thought they would. And in fact, things just kept happening to almost like push me along. And so in 2016, I ended up in a tapping class and it wasn't because I was dying to know about tapping. I needed to get out of my house and find out who I was. And that was the only energy class I could find that night. 
And that tapping teacher became one of my first teachers and guides in this part of my life. And that led to the next one that led to the next one. And I really didn't talk about it for a few years because I was trying to figure out who I was and why I was on the planet. And when you say that to people at a cocktail party or over a glass of wine, they're (laughs) like, what are you talking about? So like, I had to figure this out for myself before I could teach it. And I'm a number three in human design. So I'm a big trial and error person. And so all of my books, I basically put the best practices that I gather. But this book for sure is for me, the awakening of the feminine. Mm, Yeah. Wow. It was really helpful to hear. Like you had your own process with it where it was unfolding and then you became more comfortable to share And I love that you mentioned that throughout the book of like really seeing our own ability as women to connect with our feminine as like healing the planet, right? Like it, it's like shifting the energetic balance. And I'd love to hear from you to share with my listener, like what was the first experience of you realizing you needed to connect to your feminine energy? Hmm. Well, I'm in technology, so I'm a computer engineer. So I have been in the masculine for a long time. I just turned 51. And I would say even after having children, I wasn't, I was still really driving, striving, doing, being, getting, going, you know, like I was all outward. And I think in my forties, I really started realizing like that I was burning myself out and I was chasing an oasis that I call success. And it wasn't really delivering on any cylinder for me that really made me feel whole. And for my 40th birthday, I decided to go on a solo trip to Sedona. And I talk a lot about in the book, the guilt of asking to go, even though I was making my own money, leaving work and getting the time off. And trying to explain to people that I was like, at a crossroads of figuring out who I was and why I was here. And so I feel like it started over a decade ago, but it was really because my, my, like all my mostly masculine energy was sort of leaving me short of feeling whole. And I knew I had to shift. I just didn't know how to go about it. And that's how I ended up on a solo trip to Sedona. Yeah, I can really, really resonate with that, that sense of not feeling whole, like you're you're just focused on one aspect of yourself, like your masculine, how it shows up in your career. And I love that you gave yourself this trip. And like you said, all the steps leading up to that, I think it can be so much for women to like invest in themselves and go and plan and like give themselves that. So you did that. And it sounds like that experience, which I want to go to Sedona too. It's been on my list for so long. And it sounds like the energy there can really connect you back to yourself. Is that, was that like your experience? Well, I think a lot of things that I've done. And I think if you look at the appendix in the book Seeking, you know, I share a lot of energy practitioners I worked with. So I think for me, it kicked off allocating time for myself. And I had to do that in a big way, but that was in 2013. And I did a little bit between 2013 and 16, but then 2016, like everything kind of started falling apart. Like I had tower card moments in my life. And that's when I really started taking it very seriously. So I think I got a glimpse of like what I should be working on in 13, but I really didn't lean into it until 16. And 16 is when I really got the message to start having retreats for women outside. But I didn't do anything with that until 2018 because I didn't have the confidence to bring women outside. I was speaking on my books at a lot of conferences and I was speaking a lot from stage, but I really felt like women needed to get back outside, back in mother nature, back in spaces where they could remember how it feels to work from within and I had to really go through all those steps myself before I could help other women remember who they are, the gifts they have, and working from the inside out. Because society teaches us from when we're very little, and I think it's on purpose, that we have to live outside in. Meaning like what's happening on the outside determines how we should feel on the inside. And actually, we have to switch that around. Totally. Yeah, I just really resonate so much with this experience of, yeah, recognizing that women need to be in nature, 
and that you had to like master that before you could offer it to. Um, and just this idea of like the internal experience and that being really connected to the feminine. And I love to hear more about, you had so many good insights around like fear, self-doubt, how to navigate that. I think it's a huge issue for women and we'd love to hear like your thoughts on how can we manage our thoughts, our mindset, and I love throughout the book that you share all these tools and um, yeah, I'd love to hear from you and how that could help me. Mm. So I started my first woman's group in 2008 because I had young kids. I was working out of Silicon Valley and I was sort of lost in my choices. I, you know, even though I had help, you know, it doesn't prepare you for everything that you go through as a young mother, um, really managing your job, a high impact job and your kids. And so I started my first group in 2008 to get women together and be like, how are you making this work? This mm -hmm. have it all is really a bunch of bullshit and mm -hmm. I'm depleted and I don't even know what I should be doing and how I should be doing it. I didn't have, I felt like I was missing the cliff notes of this having it all. So I really turned to women really since my mid thirties, asking them like, how do you make this work? Because I didn't think at that point we had enough information of women helping women, you know, everyone just sort of glosses over what you have to do and how to make it work. And, you know, a lot of us feel very lonely at different parts of our lives. And so I feel like for a lot of us, we might have people to turn to, but in reality, most of us are doing it alone. And so I started taking these conversations into my books and then onto stage. And I noticed that even if I taught a lot of the strategies, like, oh, do this and then this and this, mm -hmm. women would ultimately pull me aside after the keynote or call me or connect with me on LinkedIn and say, you know, that's all great, but I'm afraid, or this isn't working because I feel like this, or my second grade teacher told me this. And throughout the years, I noticed that there's a lot of women sitting on the side of the pool wanting to jump in the water, wanting to lean into that work, wanting to get to that table. But the reality is, is they've picked up along the way a lot of stories, a lot of inner conversation that really expects them to be perfect, mm -hmm. to pursue things without failure. And the reality is, is you can't do that if you've never done it before. Like you're going to have stumbling blocks. You're going to get no's. You're going to fall down. You're going to have to get back up. And you've done this so many times before. But after the age of 35, women really are in an interesting situation at work and at home because they don't value or don't lean into their voices or knowing as much as they could because they haven't seen other people doing that. And I just started capturing all of that to just showcase, like, we're all feeling that way. We're all feeling insecure. We're all feeling like we're not good enough. We're all feeling like we doubt ourselves. Like that's happening every day, multiple times a day. So if we just address that head on, then we're like, okay, we're all feeling that way, but that yeah. should not prevent us from leaning in, stepping up and really taking on that next level of responsibility or yeah. that next class or that next, whatever that is for you. Because ultimately we need more women at more tables. And if we're waiting to be a hundred percent prepared to get there, I guarantee you, we are not going to get any farther in the next couple of decades as we are right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's so true. I think that just naming it that this is happening, there's fear, there's self-doubt, it's always going to be there, especially for women. Um, and just knowing that we don't have to be perfect in order to show up and that failing forward is actually the path forward, right? I think that just gives women permission to know the fears and doubts are not the, the sign to stop. I think that's what happens. It's like, okay, I think, you know, that statistic where it's like women don't apply to jobs that they don't have a hundred percent of the qualifications as in men like will do if they have like 50 to 75 percent or something and I feel like women just carry that into their own dreams and their visions um so I love that you're naming it you have some great questions in the book around how to like move through the fears and recognize them and I'd love to hear from you like some of the tools that you've used it was really great to see that you name a lot of the healers you worked with. And I learned a lot of new tools I'd never heard of. So I'd love to hear like, what was part of your journey? What do you recommend? 
Oh, yes. Well, that's kind of the subtitle is sidestepping self-doubt, because what I learned in my own experience is I had so much doubt, even though I have years of accolades, awards, recognition, I had so much doubt and I felt so inadequate at so many times. And I just knew if I was feeling like that way, other women were feeling that way too. And so that's really why I label it like raise your energy, which is super important to kind of help you gain momentum for where you're going. Sidestep your self-doubt, which was absolutely instrumental. And I go step-by-step step through the entire book of how I've had to sidestep my self-doubt and align with your life's work. Because many of us have seen glimpses of our life's work, but we may or may not be like working in that yet. And for me, I felt like I needed all those things to happen to really lean into the work I'm supposed to be doing. And as we've talked about before, you and I, the retreats I started in 2018 to get women outside and remembering who they are started with really just an idea that came to me, it was clearly not my idea, but it was said, bring yeah. the women outside. And I had no idea what that meant when I got that message. But over time, I met with energy practitioners. I talk about Dora in there. And, you know, she encouraged me to just create something I wanted to go to so that if nobody showed up, I'd have a day of self-care. And I think finding ways to work around your self-doubts, whether they're money, whether it's registration, whether it's destination, whatever your doubts are stemming from. And that for me was the retreat. But a lot of people's self-doubt is like fear of embarrassment, fear of feeling left out, fear of people thinking you're not good enough, fear of not being loved. Those are really what kind of stems a lot of people's fears is kind of being pushed out of the circle or not being accepted and recognizing that I had all those fears too. And finding people around you, whether you work with energy practitioners, whether you have a tribe of women that you work with, whether it's your next door neighbor, it doesn't matter. You've got to find people that are going to say, yes, but yes, that may happen, but you're still going to do it. And I think for a lot of us, pushing through those doubts are so important because a lot of times, not only did the lessons, but the joy sit on the other side of that. Totally. Yeah, that's so beautiful that it's really these three things to raise your energy, sidestep your self-doubts and align with your life's works, like working together and that the tools have been able to help you do each of these things. Um, and I think that's really helpful for people to remember when they're creating something. At least I took a lot away from that, like create something that I would love doing. And so it's really like not attaching to the external metrics that you know we talked about that really don't define success at all it's like internally what do you want to do what do you feel would be most beneficial and I feel like it helps you like take your focus away from the external which yeah. can stop people in their tracks right so much so and it's funny because when you start to lean into what is calling you in a new way. So I leaned into this retreat. I leaned into going to these energy practitioners, more things would open up for me. And I just, I don't think I would have believed it or been able to confidently share it if I didn't go through the steps myself. Mm -hmm. And now I have this amazing retreat center that I could have never envisioned for myself, but it's really because I leaned into what was calling me. I showed up consistently and then more things became available. And even when I put this book seeking off the side of my desk, I put it off to the side saying, you know, if people don't want this book, I'm just not going to write it. It's fine. That was my initial ego response. Like, fine, I'm not going to write it. But then I started getting calls where people would ask me about specific questions and they would ask it in a way that I labeled the chapter. And wow. I kept getting people calling, asking about certain things like perfectionism or your relationship with your mother or yeah. my fear of money. And I was like, okay, okay. I guess you do want me to write this book. And when I finally sat down to write it, which was about nine months after I got my last no, this just flowed out of me. And I will say that I wasn't ready to write it when I got the no's and it would have never manifested this way if I didn't get those no's and I felt so purpose-driven to write this to be like the world needs us and you'll see why and I am grateful I got the no's when I did because it would not been the way it was supposed to be right written and when you channel material some mm -hmm. of us do 
it has a mind of its own and it has a place yeah. of its own and trusting that you are a conduit for what is coming to you. That's incredible. Yeah, it's not even your own. And that's kind of my next question around like the source of your energy versus like your ego and your soul energy. Like how can you recognize when that's happening? Because I think a lot of people uh, get it mixed up. Like they're like, oh, I think I'm supposed to be doing this, but it's really their ego, like kind of driving things. So um, you have like really helpful charts in here. Um, yeah, what, how can we notice when it's our ego versus our soul that's like guiding us on our journey? Yeah. So my engineering mind, uh, <laughs> I had to write the charts because mm -hmm. I needed to group things out. And that chapter, when the editor was going through it with me, she was like, I don't really understand what you mean. And so I wrote these ego and soul energy charts. And the way that I grouped it is ego energy is often fear, worry, and anxiety or avoidance and soul energy is abundance, love, and gratitude. And so I always check in by just even throwing my hand in my heart being like, okay, yeah. Is this love or fear? Is this love or fear? And then is this my voice or is this the voice of, you know, my intuition and my voice and my intuition is usually very soft and not very detailed. <laughs> yeah. And so creating space for that to come through is really what I talk about in the book is finding space for you to have the ability to hear your intuition. And a lot of times, if you're always living in fear, worry, anxiety, and avoidance, that will take up all your space. And so being able to compartmentalize that, and that could be just learning to meditate or picking up mindfulness or walking outside without a phone and trying to just identify things you see, like really working on space, which I talk a lot of detail about, gives mm. you the ability to let your intuition come through. Totally. Yeah. If you're always go, 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 you don't have, um, yeah, that ability to pause and like tune inwards and really listen. And like you said, the inner voice is very quiet. It's not going to rise above um, everything that you're doing in your day to day. So you have to make the space, go out in nature, connect. And yeah, these charts are really helpful to guide you and see, okay, is this actually, um, yeah, guiding me towards like my soul desires. And I think you have a similar idea around like money and the energy around that. I'd love to hear your perspective. I think that's a subject that I've been diving into a lot lately and yeah, I'd love to hear your insights around the energy of money. Mm. So I think I heard about Lynn Twist probably late 1990s, early 2000, but it didn't resonate with me then. It wasn't until 2016 when I was going through all of that stuff internally and externally. I was unloading the dishwasher. I had Super Soul Sunday on and Lynn Twist was on and she was talking about abundance mindset, fear of money. And I had just lost a big account for my own business. And I was freaking out that like, I couldn't make this work. And everything that she sent said meant something to me. I really felt like I was on her vibe, on her frequency. And so I downloaded that book that weekend, The Soul of Money, and took it with me on a family trip. And I, every day I would walk and listen to the book. And it was so eye-opening how I had been taught about money how I viewed money, how we as a society view money and how to shift that mindset. And so she was one of my big first teachers about money. I then went on to listen to Denise and others. And I even have uh, a doc, like a piece of paper on my wall that says, get rich from the energy you create in exchange. And I've had to really shift my mindset to really shift my mindset around money because I grew up with very little money. So just really going more to an abundance mindset. And it's amazing how many things come my way from gifts to tickets, to opportunities to travel and meet with women. Like I thought it was a very linear mm. situation. And until I really changed my mindset around money and opened up myself more being more in the present moment, I didn't recognize all the ways money was coming to me. And I really see money as experience now. So how many different experiences am I having? How rich is my life? And what type of energy is, am I exchanging? And shifting that mindset around money has been a complete game changer for me. 
Yeah, I can totally see that. And I really, really resonate with how you're sharing that. It's like how, what energy you ascribe to money. And like, if you just look at it as numbers, you're not taking into account all these experiences it brings, all these other benefits to your life that aren't just so linear, like you said, and and just allowing those things to happen. I think just is connected to the feminine energy too, because it's not about like going out and doing something to get money, right? It's like the energy that you said creates the money or the quality of the energy. Oh, incredible. And I would love to talk about relationships with you because I think that's just something that's so big on the spiritual path and seeking path. And um, yeah, that I have navigated, continue to navigate. It's like you shift in vibration, you do some inner work and then all of a sudden, you know, someone's like not on the same path as you anymore. And I love what you wrote about that in the book and, and would love to hear your experience of like how to navigate shifts in relationships that come from your energy um, increasing in your vibration. Mm, yeah, tricky, tricky. So I really see all of us as, as really we're on a band of, of energy, a frequency, you know, FM radio stands for frequency modulation. So thinking about, are you at 92.1 FM radio? Are you at 102.7 or do you fall somewhere in between? There is no right answer, but wherever you are on the spectrum is what you generally attract. And as Katie Byron would say, one of my favorite authors, I'm sorry, Byron Katie would say, I always slip her name around, is she would say is that you are experiencing relationships based on where you are internally. So our relationships are a reflection of the energy that we are putting out in the world. And so if you're seeing that you're doing a lot of work inside and out, you're reading the books, you're going to classes, you're meditating, you're having these great spiritual experiences outside. And then you come back to relationships. You just need to check in. Like, is this relationship mirroring the energy that I was at or the energy where I am or the energy where mm -hmm. I'm going? Generally, you don't have to say anything. People will fall off pretty naturally when you shift your frequency. And if they're supposed to leave, if people are going to catch up with you or ahead of you, you know, those will generally stay intact. So I wouldn't get my really mm -hmm. wrapped around the axle on like, do I need to have this conversation? Mm -hmm. And do I need to get into where I'm at emotionally and spiritually. I think not. I think save yourself, just continue to work on yourself and things around you will shift without saying a thing. Oh, that's some great advice there. I think a lot of people get tripped up in like having a conversation or how do you, you know, express where you're at and how's that different, but energetically letting it unfold and just focusing on you and it, they will like fade away like you said if they're not meant to be on your path and that's what I really liked how you wrote like we're all in this path and then some people come on some people come off and it just allows for a lot of acceptance and honoring of other people's paths without making them wrong and um, and like you said it's also a reflection of your personal energy and I know uh, for my own work on myself, like my relationship with my mom has just benefited from that. And it's because I did my own inner healing around that. And I know you speak about mothers and that relationship in the book, and would love to hear about what you've learned from healing and seeking in terms of that. Mm, well, we heal, we heal the linear line. So you could be healing people all the way back to your great grandmother and then some, or your offspring's you know, when you work to hear, heal or just really get to know your inner child and work through some of the energies, a lot of those energies, I believe, are from past lives. They might not even make sense to you right now, but you may be healing a lineage of souls that traveled with you at that time. And some of them are here with you now. And just recognizing that everyone plays a strategic role in the life that you're living. And so if you're like, well, I don't know why this is happening or I don't understand this. Be like, just shift the mindset to be like, what am I learning? What am I learning? Because as all of us that do spiritual work have heard once or a million times, right? Life is happening for me. That's not happening yeah. to me. And so your relationships are the most important aspect of your life because they will bring you your deepest lessons and some of the lessons could be across timelines or across 
soul journeys and just recognizing that you may be lessons for others too. And so with mothers, I feel like I had to write about mothers because so many women that I talk to will reference their mother in some capacity. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of healing that needs to happen. And it's not anyone's fault per se. It's just a lot of how society is set up right now for women. And I feel like it's really important that we do that inner work because our daughters, nieces, neighbors are watching us. And if we really do want to balance the masculine and feminine, we need to heal the feminine linear line. Yes. Yes. That's what it is. It's not even healing just you. It's like your lineage and recognizing that everyone that came before you is helping you and is serving you in your journey now, even if it doesn't make sense. And I think that gives you a lot of um, like solidarity too. It's like, you're not alone in it. And your mom is your first relationship with a woman, like when you're a woman. So it really does have a huge impact in like how you show up in the world. And yeah, I've just had the opportunity to do that healing myself and just see how much it's given to me. And it's a focus too, of like the woman I work with, because um, otherwise you're carrying a lot of like that resentment, like societal resentment, even maybe that's like not even personal. Um, but just being able to be yourself fully and honor those that came before you can help shift the feminine energy. So um, I love that you included that. And um, I also wanted to talk about, um, oh, the part of where you said, like, do we pick our mothers? Like, do you believe that we do choose like our soul family? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I do believe in the soul family. I feel like you all have like, um, you have a pack before you come down. And it could be one of my soul family members is somebody I met when I was 13. She was one of my first bosses and I've stayed in touch with her. In fact, I spoke with her this morning and, uh, you know, I've been with her for 48 years now and she was one of like one of my first bosses. So I think that we do have people that we've chosen to come down with. And it's really interesting because it's usually a very familiar relationship, good or bad, but it's very familiar. Mm, yeah. That's incredible that you are still on the path together. And like, that's when, you know, it's like this soul connection, right? Um, that's like just having so much value. And um, yeah, so I, I also want to just touch on the part around like doing work that aligns with your purpose. And you touched on this at the start of our conversation, but it's almost like you have to let your old life crumble in a sense, but maybe not at all at once. So if my listener is doing work that is not in line with their vision or their purpose, how can they start to take the steps toward that? Well, I would say that you're, you're learning something that's going to help you later. So, you know, I started off in computers. I did that till I was over 40 years old. Uh, I worked in Silicon Valley on all different jobs. And I was about to leave my job to go do this full time in 2012. And I got this great opportunity to run a really big piece of the business on its go to market strategy. And so I stayed. And first I was doubting myself, I should get off and do this, but I use a lot of lessons that I learned from that job. And so I don't think anything you're doing now is a waste. Mm -hmm. I feel like every piece of, every piece of the long-term goal uses portions of things that you've touched along the way. And in fact, I was yeah. in Miami beach, uh, staying uh, at a hotel by myself and I got a uh, birth chart reading, which I've s since learned birth charts. And they're super fascinating of kind of telling you where you are along your path and what's going on. But I will tell you that in 2017, when I met with her, she said in 2024, this is all going to come together. And I started crying because I was like, oh my gosh, like, when am I going to get there? Yeah. And it was just like, so drained. I felt like from my experiences and so frustrated but now that it's 2024, I laugh because I literally needed every single moment, every mm -hmm. step, every job, 
every experience to know that right now, like I am in my life's work. Wow. Yeah, I totally resonate. And that's been my experience. And I think that's really helpful for my listener to hear where it's allowing for more patience and trust in your path that maybe it's not linear and that it's serving you in a sense, like it wasn't uh, for nothing. And it's like, for you, it sounds like it was all like about the timing. And then you had the birth chart reading, which is so cool. I've never, I mean, I have read my own chart, but like never had a reading of like different um, periods in your life where things will line up. And I'm so happy to hear that you're at 2024 and it's like unfolded and finally, and it's looking back, you can see that everything was leading you to this place. Yeah. So I would just say, do things off the side of your desk, go to classes, go to retreats, read books, uh, you know, get into a tribe of people that are doing things that you like, get that certification, like whatever you can do off the side of your desk while you're sort of waiting for the opportunity to present itself is what the universe is expecting of you. Because if you're just saying, okay, at this date, I'm going to completely switch over one, It's very difficult because you don't know your revenue streams. You don't really know how you're going to serve and you might not have the skill set you want. So that's why I'm a big proponent of doing it off the side of your desk, Mm -hmm. figuring that out before you leap so that you have some confidence that when you do leap, you know what you're going into and what you're going to offer. Because leaping out of your full-time job, as you know, Emily, like there's a lot of stuff you have to work through personally. Like I had a lot of ego energy I had to work through because I only knew myself in tech, in corporate. And when I ripped all that away, I had a a big identity crisis. Who am I? What do I have to offer? Am I really worth it? And that was, it took a while. That was like an 18 month process. And I had revenue streams and I knew what I was doing. And I still went through that Mm -hmm. Ooh, that exhausting period of life that really was necessary for me to value myself. Yeah. Yeah. And I think no one really talks about that. I think we only hear the overnight successes or like the people that are just like, okay, I'm going to jump into this. And it's like, I think for the most part, it's the opposite. Like it is an identity shift. It is um, just a personal development journey and starting a business that I don't think a lot of people realize and um, and skills that you need so doing it like you have behind you progress over perfection it's just like taking the steps forward while you can and I like that term off the side of your desk so um, I think that's very inspiring for my listener to hear because I know a lot of them have these interests like outside of work and just like continuing to follow those those intuitive insights and where you're feeling called and seeking And I love for you to share with my listener, like, what do you offer? What are your other books? Like, share with us everything. I feel like all my books are the journey of a woman, really, because it's, you know, my first book is when I had young kids and like, how do I make sure I don't lose myself in my guesses? My second book is how to get promoted or get on a board after the age of 35. Mm -hmm. And my third book is, hey, when you've gotten all the things you thought you wanted and you still feel empty. Now it's time to seek from the inside out. And I feel like it's been a journey for me. Each of my books really represents my own journey as interwoven into the book, but really they're filled with things that I wish I had that would have shortened my lessons and ultimately accelerated my path. Yeah, that's incredible. And these are huge uh, turning points like in women's lives that exactly there aren't a lot of resources there isn't a lot of support around it and I love that you created like I think even before we were talking you started this women's group around like when you uh, were a mother like how are you all doing this on your own you know and I think that's been the biggest journey for me and yeah coming back to my feminine energy is like oh my god I don't do so many things alone anymore like I'm co-working with friends I'm asking for help and it's like we weren't meant to do it alone so yeah (laughs) yeah it's great I feel like obviously with the shift of the moon with the eclipse coming up we're moving into the sixth sun I'm sorry with the shift of the sun the sixth sun we're going through with the eclipse coming up with 2012 and we've changed to the off the Mayan calendar like all of these things spiritually are happening because life as we know it is shifting and that heavy, heavy masculine energy is being lifted up, but it still requires women to, and men to lean into their feminine so that we can balance out the energy that is so necessary right now on the planet. 
Totally. Wow. Mm -hmm. The timing there. I didn't know with the astrology lining up. Um, yeah. I really sense that though, the over masculine energy is not working anymore. And, and I love the work that you're doing to help women to shift back into that. And so you uh, also offer retreats as well. I'd love for you to share that with my listener. Yeah. So the retreats for me, as I mentioned earlier, were following my intuition and sort of guidance from above. And now I do a handful of retreats every year, most of them on Lake Erie. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have some opportunities to do some international retreats too, but the whole idea is bringing people back to remembering. And I think for a lot of us, we comes in all different ways, different times in our lives, different situations that happen but it's been pretty amazing. I work with a ton of energy practitioners, uh, a lot of sound healers, and just amazing. I have a community called Together We Seek, and it's really where a lot of the energy practitioners that I work with come together. So you don't have to be on Google, like searching for things yeah. like I was for years. Right. <laughs> I really brought everyone together in one community. And it's just amazing to have all these people working together in a way that I haven't seen before out, you know, in a virtual space. Yeah, that's incredible. And yeah, I would love to know where can my listener find you online? Oh, you can find me just about anywhere. If you're looking for the book Seeking, make sure you put Seeking and the initials JJ. Otherwise, you might end up on a dating site. Oh. <laughs> uh, but you can find me. Yeah, you can find JJ D. Geronimo on Goodreads, and all the links will be below so you can check those out. But yeah, I'd love to hear your story. I'd love to hear what you're working on. And I feel like it takes all of us and we're all agreed to be down here together. So why not help each other? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for the work you do in Uplifting Women. I'm so excited we could connect. And yeah, I will link everything in the show notes. Check out the book Seeking. And if you resonate with other books as well, like where you're at on your journey, um, those will also be linked. So thank you so much, JJ, for sharing your wisdom with us today. Thank you, Emily. And thank you for the work you're doing. All of us, all of us benefit from it. So thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you.